Do you make a great income or have a surplus to save and you're wondering what to do with it to keep more of it with you versus pay it all away in taxes? Well, today I'm going to walk you through the 11 strategies that we go through with clients to help keep more of your hard-earned income with you versus giving it to the IRS. I'm Scott with Sirens Financial Group, where we partner with clients to help answer their key questions and bring solutions to them around understanding, are they on track for retirement? What can you do to improve your financial picture? And how can you help reduce your overall tax situation? So you're making a great income or an above average income, or you just have a surplus to save and you're wondering where to save it in the most tax efficient way, right? The overall goal, whether it be your income or your savings, is keeping more of it with you versus giving it to the IRS in taxes. Before we dive into the 11 strategies, I think it's first important to help you understand the basics, and I mean basics of your tax bill, but just keeping it simple today will really help you understand these strategies as well as maybe some actions that you can take. So when it comes to your tax bill and how much you're gonna pay in taxes, just first off, the more income that you have, right? The higher your tax bracket might be. So there's, uh, right now there's um, 10%, 12%, there's 20% brackets, there's 30% brackets, um, and that can all change over time. So the goal is, is, well, what can we do to reduce that? Now, some other basics when it comes to the calculation of that tax bill, and again, consult a, a tax preparer, but let's just keep this basic for today. When it comes to that final number that you're going to owe the government in taxes, let's keep it simple. It's all based upon how much you have coming in. And when I say how much you have coming in, I'm talking about income. And this could be your wages, your pension, tips. This could be your retirement income, right? Withdrawals from those IRAs, 401ks. That's what's coming in. Also, what's coming in could be dividends, interest, gains. This could be short-term gains or long-term gains. Now, that could be from like your brokerage accounts, CDs, checking, savings, money markets, right? Those are adding to your tax bill each and every year as well. And then you subtract deductions. And now there's above the line deductions, below the line deductions. But again, let's just keep this simple for today. What's coming in minus deductions. And then that's going to be your taxable income. And that's what help, That's what kind of determines your tax bill. The higher that taxable income, the higher tax rate that you fall into, the higher your tax bill is going to be. So what can we do about it, right? If we want to reduce our taxes, there's, well, looking at those that formula that we just discussed, you can reduce your income, you can reduce dividends, interest, and gains, or you can increase your deductions. So I just wanted you to really think about that basic formula because it'll help you in regards to the 11 strategies that we're going to discuss and maybe understand where it is that you can take action. Now, regarding all of this, I highly recommend consulting with your financial advisor as well as your tax preparer before making any final decisions. If you don't have a financial advisor, we're happy to meet with you and determine if there's a potential good fit there to help you through these, these strategies. But consult with your financial advisor, your tax preparer, your team before making any financial decisions. All right, with that, Let's dive in. Also, stick around to the end where I'm going to talk about the three thought processes to go through to help you decide on which strategies to implement and when. All right, our first strategy is all around retirement accounts, and it actually has multiple parts to it of how you could utilize retirement accounts to, again, keep more of your money with you and in your pocket versus giving it to the IRS in taxes. So first off, you can maximize your company-sponsored retirement plans, whether that be a 401k, 403b, or 457, um, putting money into those plans, by doing that, you're going to get a tax deduction today. So you're reducing your taxable income today. Now, remember, by putting money into those accounts and it all grows tax deferred, you are going to have to take required minimum distributions in your future. Right now, that's starting at age 72, and that could always always change as well. So while you get that tax deduction today, you will have to pay taxes in the future. So regarding these accounts, 
one of my suggestions is, is make sure you're at least getting your company match. But even more so, if you've got a high income coming in and you feel like your taxes will be lower in the future, then you want to maximize these accounts. Maximize the deduction that you can that you can get by putting as much into these accounts as that as your plan will allow based on your age. Now, another thought process could be, and you might be wondering, hey, Scott, wait a second, my company also, also offers the Roth 401k. Now, the Roth 401k, you're not getting a deduction today. However, all of that money that you put in there, that money will grow tax-free and you can make withdrawals tax-free in your future. So that might be a decision that you want to make if you feel like you'll be in a higher tax bracket in the future. Regarding 401k versus Roth 401k, I've made a, another video on this. I'll put a link to the video, um, link to that video in this video here, as well as in the comments. So you can go and, and uh, take a look at that video as well. The next item, let's now say that you've maximized your 401k or your Roth 401k or your other company sponsored retirement plan. And you're saying, now, where do I go with my money? I don't want it to cause extra dividends and interest. Well, maybe then you can also put some money into your IRA or Roth IRA, and you can maximize those accounts as well. Now, one thing to be clear here is that each of these have thresholds where you would no longer be able to make um, contributions and from the IRA standpoint, get a deduction, right? So IRAs get the deduction, Roth IRAs pay tax today, grows tax free. But it's something you want to think about. So another area that you could go to and put money in so it's not in your savings and generating that dividends, interest, and gains. So maybe we've maximized our company-sponsored retirement plans. We can or can't put into the IRAs and Roths. Where do we go next? Uh, a thought process or strategy that you might want to consider is the backdoor Roth. Now, I'm going to be very um, – I want to bring up a point here. You have to be very careful of the pro rata rule, okay? Be very careful of the pro rata rule. This is why I say consult with your team, tax preparer and financial advisor be, before doing this. But this is a way you might say, boy, I make way too much income to put into my IRA or my Roth. How can I still get money into that Roth account? I really like that tax-free growth. Well, this is where you're going to make an after-tax contribution to your IRA and then convert it over to a Roth IRA. Now, again, because of that pro rata rule, if you have other IRAs, those other IRAs can now become taxable income in that conversion. So you have to be really, really careful with this. Um, but it is a great strategy to use if you don't have other IRAs or if you just are looking to make that conversion, um, talk with your team. And then the last one to maybe consider, and this all is dependent on your company plan, but you might be able to make an after-tax 401k contribution. So what does this mean? This means that you've maxed out your 401k contribution where you can actually get a deduction for it, right? So you're, you're putting money into your 401k, you get the deduction up to that, that amount, that max contribution amount. This is then making a contribution after that amount. You might be thinking, well, why would I do that? Yes, it's an after-tax contribution. So you're, you're no longer going to get the deduction for it. By doing that, that money that's there now grows tax deferred. You're deferring all tax on the growth of that money to your future. So there's some pros and cons of that. But if you're looking to keep money out of those brokerage accounts, checking sav saving CDs, right, reducing that um, interest, dividends, and gains, this is a way to, again, defer some of that to your future if you feel like your future tax rate will be lower. So next on the list is the investments in your taxable accounts. Let's just say that you maxed out all of the retirement accounts and you still have money that you want to save, but you want to do it in the most tax efficient manner. Or, or you're just looking for tax diversification in your overall financial picture. Folks, this is one thing that I highly recommend is to have tax diversification in your picture, meaning you have money or savings in all different types of tax buckets. The tax deferred, like the IRAs, 401ks, the tax free, like the Roth IRAs, and then what we're going to talk about here, the taxable bucket. 
where this is, yes, you are going to get taxed each and every year on your dividends, your interest, and any recognized gains. But by having money in each of the different buckets, you are now have different buckets to go to to make withdrawals in your future, no matter what the tax rates do. If they go up or if they go down, you are diversified from a tax standpoint. Okay. So you've got that surplus or you're looking to be tax diversified. You want to continue to save, but in the most tax efficient way, how do we do that? Well, first off, if you are going to have money in a brokerage account, these taxable accounts, right, which could be a brokerage account, which could be CDs, money markets. But our focus here is kind of if you were investing in a, a brokerage account, first off is having a long term focus be, instead of a short term focus. And here's why any gains that are recognized short term, you have to pay uh, short term gains, the short term gains tax rate, which is your ordinary income tax rate. All right. So back to our form that trying to keep income down or trying to keep interest, dividends and gains down short term, you're looking at ordinary income tax rates. But if you're recognizing gains at one year or after, right, so short term is one year under long term gains is if you're recognizing this could be like selling a stock, you had a gain in that stock, but you waited till at least after one year to sell that stock, the gains that you're going to pay on that are now at a more favorable rate, the long term gains rate. So just by having that long term focus, you're now reducing your tax bill on any of the gains that you're recognizing in your account. Our next item, again, in this strategy of investing in taxable accounts is using tax efficient funds. What do I mean by this? Well, this would be like utilizing individual stocks or utilizing exchange traded funds. I think that those are more tax efficient. Here's why. By use it, like, let's just use individual stocks from a, a, uh, an example, right? You now are controlling when you're buying and selling these individual stocks. So if you are able to control when you're buying and selling them and you have that more long-term focus, any gains that you have could be recognized at the long-term capital gains rate. Same thing with the exchange traded funds. You might hear them called ETFs. You have more control when you actually, you, you don't recognize, for the most part, you don't recognize gains in those ETFs until you buy or sell them versus like a mutual fund because see using mutual funds what happens is that the mutual fund itself in that mutual fund there's a manager that's buying and selling stocks um, or f other funds right stocks bonds or other funds in that mutual fund and as that manager makes buys and sells well all of those gains or losses are passed through to you the mutual fund owner so at the end of the year, the mutual fund manager can go in and they can do a bunch of buying and selling and buying and selling. And all of those gains that they recognize pass right through to you, the mutual fund owner. And if they did that in under a year, you're going to be paying ordinary income tax on all of those gains. So you really don't have as much control when utilizing that mutual fund. And you might at the end of the year, if you, if you own mutual funds, this will maybe click to you. At the end of the year, you might be like, wow, I just got this really big tax bill, but I didn't see any of the money in my pocket. That's why all of this is flow through. So you might not have sold your mutual fund, but because of those trades uh, that they were recognizing within there, it's flowing through to your tax bill. So using tax efficient funds can help, again, help reduce those dividends, interest and gains in your taxable accounts. All right, our next item here is being more growth focused. Why do I bring this up? Well, by having a more growth focus or growth approach, right? Utilizing equities, stocks, um, items that are um, more likely pushing off dividends or more likely um, you, where you can recognize long-term gains can help reduce the overall taxes that you'll pay in these taxable accounts. Because let's just say you're using bonds and bond funds. You have those in your taxable account. Well, those push off interest. Interest is taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. So if you've got IRAs, Roth IRAs, right and over here, and you've got your taxable account here, 
you might want to put more of your equities in your taxable account, focusing again on long-term capital gains, a lower tax rate versus having your bonds and bond funds there. Of course, you need to do what's right for you and your risk tolerance, but it's kind of making a little bit of shift that will help keep more money potentially in your pocket. Now, let's just say that you're like, okay, Scott, based on my risk tolerance, I need some bond and bond funds in my taxable account. Based on where, what tax bracket you are in, right? So maybe you're in those 30% tax brackets. Something that you might want to consider then is utilizing um, bond or bond funds that push off tax exempt interest. So instead of being taxed on the interest that they put push off, it's actually tax exempt. So examples of this would be like municipal bonds or municipal bond funds. Again, back to our formula, doing things to either reduce your income, reduce your dividends, interest, and gains, or trying to get those gains to long-term versus short-term to, again, help reduce your overall tax burden. Let's move on. Okay, the third strategy is utilizing your health savings account if offered to you by your company. This is a great, great account, and here's why. I call it the triple tax advantaged account. First first off, by putting money into your health savings account, you actually get a tax deduction in the year that you put the money in. So reducing our income. The money grows tax-free. And as long as you use that money for qualified medical expenses, you get to withdraw it tax-free as well. So now you're just taking a portion of your income, you're getting a deduction and putting it into this account where all that growth, you're not going to have to pay any taxes on those dividends, interest, or gains. And then the money you get to take out tax-free as well. All right, the fourth strategy that we're going to talk about is deferred compensation plans. Again, you're going to have to go to your employer to see if this is something that they do or do not offer. But re what this is from a conceptual standpoint is that you're taking some of your income from today, right? So let's just say you're making $200,000 a year. If the company offers a deferred compensation plan, what you're saying is, hey, instead of giving all of that $200,000 a year, I just want $150,000. And let's take 50 of that and we're going to defer it to a future time frame. So you might be retiring in a couple of years. So you're saying, hey, let's defer some of that income until I retire, right? Because you might feel that you're going to be at a lower tax rate, lower tax bracket in retirement than where you're at today. Folks, I hope that you're enjoying this video so far and finding value and benefit from it. If so, and you'd like to see additional videos just like this to help you build wealth and reduce your overall tax picture, subscribe to our YouTube channel and check us out on lifemoneyshow.com. Again, that's lifemoneyshow.com where we've got a lot of great content to help you and your financial future. All right, let's move on. All right, the fifth strategy that I want to talk about is utilizing 529 plans. You might say, well, how does this come into play? And maybe you have children or grandchildren where you want to help support them and their college education costs. So by utilizing a 529 plan, as you take the money and put it into the 529 plan, you're deferring all of those dividends, interest, and gains, right? So back to our formula, reduce dividends, interest, and gains. Getting it into the 529 plan, you're deferring those dividends, interest, and gains. And as long as they're used for qualified expenses, you'll never have to pay tax on, on, that line, on those line items, right? So this is something to look at if you're looking to help somebody, again, with education costs. It's getting money out of today's taxable income, deferring it, and then being able to use it tax-free as long as it's used for qualified expenses. All right, our sixth strategy is potentially utilizing a tax deferred annuity. Where does this come into play? It comes into play regarding those taxable investments. Remember when, when we were talking about that in our second strategy, I said that there was those short-term gains, there's dividends, there's interest uh, or long-term gains and all of that adds into your taxable income each and every year. Well, by putting some of those funds into a tax deferred annuity, you're now deferring deferring those taxes until a future date, until you decide to make those withdrawals from the annuity. 
But folks, put a big asterisk next to this one. And, and here's what the asterisk is, is that when you do decide to make those withdrawals in the future, when you make those withdrawals, you are going to be paying ordinary income tax, your ordinary income tax rate on all of the gains. So if you've put this money in there and you've let it sit for years, right? So you're past that one year long-term gains, tap, capital gains rate, favorable rate, you're not going to get the long-term gains favorable rate. You're going to pay in an ordinary income tax rate. So that's a big asterisk there. You have to make that decision. Does it make more sense for you to recognize gains and pay long-term gains rate as you go and, and need to make withdrawals and, and recognize those gains? Or does it make more sense for you to push everything into the future? But be aware, you are going to pay your ordinary income tax rate. The seventh strategy to consider is how you get taxed from a business standpoint. So let's just say you're self-employed or you own a company or you're an independent contractor. How you set yourself up can, from a business standpoint can make a huge difference. Looking at should you get taxed as a sole proprietor versus an S corp versus a C corp can make a large difference in how much at the end of the day uh, comes to you versus what gets paid out in taxes. So I'm not going to go into all of the detail in this video regarding all of those different items. That's for another video and another day. You really want to consult again with your, your financial advisor and a tax preparer. The eighth strategy is utilizing life insurance that builds cash value. Now, I just first want to say, what is life insurance primarily for? Life insurance is primarily to provide a death benefit. So there's a cost to life insurance. There's going to be a cost to building cash value in a life insurance policy. Now, some policies, and, and again, every policy is different, but some policies, the way that they're structured, you're able to build cash value in them and then make uh, tax-free loans from those uh, policies. So again, you're getting those dividends, interest, and gains out of your current taxable income, getting them into the life insurance policy, letting it build, build all tax deferred, right? And then maybe being able to make tax-free withdrawals from that policy. Again, you really want to make sure that you read into the life insurance policy, know how it fully works, and realize, like I'd mentioned, that life insurance is primarily built for death benefit. So there's a cost to life insurance. There's a cost to trying to build cash value in your life insurance policy. Next on our list is utilizing real estate to help reduce your taxable income. So for the most part, we've been talking about reducing income or reducing dividends, interest, and gains. But by utilizing real estate, you might actually be able to increase your deductions. You might be able to take and depreciate that real estate in your tax bill, increasing your deductions, therefore lowering your taxable income and lowering the overall taxes that you need to pay to the IRS. Our ninth strategy actually has multiple parts to it. And it's all about charitable contributions. Again, this goes to maximizing or increasing those deductions to help lower your overall tax bill. So let's just say that you are charitable. And uh, one way that you can maybe increase your annual deductions is through a donor advised fund. Because right now you might be making charitable contributions, but because the standard deduction is so high, you're not able to claim those charitable contributions that you're making. So what, just a very, from a conceptual standpoint, is from uh, for donor advised funds, it's taking multiple years of donations and bunching them all into basically one group, right? And you're gonna take that one group and deduct it all in the same year. You don't have to make the contributions that year. You just are making the, you're taking the deduction all in the same year and then paying those contributions out over one year, two years, multiple years, whatever you so choose. But again, this might be a strategy that if you are very charitable, you're close to that, um, you're close to going over that standard deduction, but you're not really there. This could be a way for you to um, not only get the benefits of giving to others, but also being able to, to make a larger deduction from your overall tax bill. 
Another item that you could do is you could gift appreciated stock, right? So instead of recognizing those gains yourself in your overall taxes, instead of giving cash to a charity, you can gift appreciated stock to a charity. And then our last item under the charitable strategy is QCDs. And what this stands for is qualified charitable distributions. This is giving uh, part of, let's just say your R required minimum distribution, right? So you're giving part of your IRA or your 401k directly to the charitable organization. Now that's a key part. It has to go directly to the charitable organization from your IRA. But let me just give you the concept of how this works. Let's say that um, you're age 72 and you have a required distribution to take of $50,000. Instead of taking all of that $50,000, which you would have to, right, all of that $50,000 would go to your taxable income, right? Instead of taking all that, maybe you're charitable. So you're saying, hey, I want to give $10,000 directly to a charitable organization. So therefore, you're going to take that $50,000 minus the $10,000 that you gave to the charitable organization. And now your taxable income from that withdrawal is only $40,000. So you just reduced your taxable income. In addition, you're still going to get, if you're taking the standard deduction, you're still going to get that in addition to this strategy. So it's a way to, um, again, give to others, but still get recognized for that and, and get help in lowering your overall tax bill. All right, so our 11th strategy is gifting. You might be thinking, well, wait a second, that's giving money to others. How does that help me in my tax situation? Well, let's just say part of your goals is to pass something on to your heirs. And if you're in a very high tax bracket today and you've got a lot of money sitting in those taxable accounts causing that dividends and interest, maybe some short-term or long-term gains, maybe it makes sense to gift some of this money to your heirs and get it out of your taxable income. Maybe your heirs are actually at a lower tax bracket than you. So they'll be getting taxed at a lower rate on those dividends, interest, and gains. So that's one way to think about it. Now, but there's one other thing that you really need to think about and rules can always change. But right now, there's also what's called the step up in cost basis, meaning that if you were to pass away um, and your heirs inherited any stock, mutual funds, um, exchange traded funds, right, they get a step up in cost basis. So basically, those from a conceptual standpoint, those gains are kind of wiped away. They're starting at the new level, whatever the level is at once you've uh, upon your passing. So there's some trade-offs there, right? Maybe getting some of it out of your taxable estate helps today. Uh, maybe your children need, uh, children or beneficiaries need help with something. So it's a, it's a good way to get it out of your taxable estate and help them out. Or maybe you wanna consider um, you know, waiting because of that step up and cost basis. Again, all of those rules can, can change, but um, something to look at with your financial advisor as well as your tax preparer. Just to wrap up, I, I wanna walk you through the three thought processes that you should really be thinking about um, that will help you understand when to take action or what actions you might want to take uh, regarding these strategies. First is understanding what do you believe uh, the tax rates are today versus what do you feel the tax rates will be in the future? The second is what is your taxable income today versus what might your taxable income be in the future? And the key thing here is a lot of people always think that, oh, my taxes will be lower in retirement. But don't forget about those required minimum distributions because if you've saved up a healthy amount into those IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, those required minimum distributions, the government's gonna force you to take money out all of a sudden that could potentially put you in a higher tax bracket in your future than where you're at today. And then the last is timing. Timing of when do you make the action happen? When do you make the strategy happen, right? So maybe this is the right year, maybe next year is the right year. It's all looking again at your total picture, your total situation to determine when's the right time, what do you think tax rates are doing, and just looking at that global picture constantly on an annual basis 
to each and every year come up with the decisions that you feel will help put you in the best position possible. Hey, I hope that you got a lot of great value and benefit from this video. And if so, and you'd like to see additional videos just like this to help you build wealth and reduce your long-term tax picture, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, connect with us on lifemoneyshow.com. That's lifemoneyshow.com where we have a lot of content coming out. You'll continue to get notified of new podcasts, videos, blog posts to help you and your financial future. Thanks and have a great day.